Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another exciting lecture with Dr. Ronald J. Brown. Our talk, uh, topic for today is the history of the Lower East Side of Manhattan, one of the most exciting neighborhoods that really reflects the history of New York City in one single neighborhood. We'll begin, according to the outline, with the rise of the Lower East Side as a distinct neighborhood. This was in the late colonial and early republic when poor Scotch and English people settled there. By the mid-1800s, the Irish and Germans were taking over. The late 1800s, it was Eastern European Jews who were moving in. Well, following 1965, it transformed again into an ethnic neighborhood for Chinese and Hispanic immigrants. And we'll wrap it up with the last group of immigrants to settle in the Lower East Side. And these are, in the very near future, going to be aliens from Mars or Jupiter or Saturn. When they start migrating to the United States, they are also going to go naturally to the Lower East Side. So let's get started on our exploration of this absolutely wonderful neighborhood. For the Lower East Side, if you see from the map, this is the bottom of uh, uh, Manhattan. Uh, almost in the middle, you see Broadway going north, cutting right through the middle, going from Battery Park at the bottom, up by City Hall, and then continuing up NYU and up through, and the whole length of Manhattan. Well, various neighborhoods emerged and took shape in this bottom chunk of Manhattan. You see Little Italy, the top in the middle. Below that is Chinatown. To the right, going east, we see the Lower East Side. And you can see it has a somewhat of a grid plan from East Broadway and the East Riverside Drive, Jackson, Montgomery, Rutgers, Pike. And this is the famous Lower East Side on the East River. Now, if you also look at the map, you'll see, too, that... The grid plan, which dates from the early 1800s, was above all of this. It's only when you get up to 14th Street that goes from the East River to the Hudson River that you have the grid. You do see chunks of grid, such as the Lower East Side has a little bit of grid to it, but uh, not uh, that much. Up in Soho, you get a couple of grids uh, along Christie, Forsyth, and Allen. But this is the old part of Manhattan before the famous grid. Well, the first people who settled in the Lower East Side were Scotch and English immigrants. Beginning 1776 uh, revolution, and once the revolution was over, more and more people started moving in. Now, if you look at the map on the left, you see what was New York in 1776, and you'll see the lower half of Manhattan, lower chunk of Manhattan, and is gradually moving north. And you see another little neighborhood that is sort of a grid plan. But along the East River, there's nothing because that was a swampy area. When it rained, that area filled up with water. It kept it. It was filled with mosquitoes and snakes. And I don't know if they had crocodiles there, but it was the worst place in the world to live. And so it was neglected, and only the poorest of the poor, who had no other choice, would go into these swamps, drain an area, build a house out of wood, and make it their home. So it was called the Lower East Side, which I abbreviate here as LES, 
because it was low-lying swampy. There was even a pond there called the Collect Pond, which we can see in the map. And we see the swampy meadow area, which is the um, worst place in the world you'd want to live in the colonial period and even into the early 1800s. But in 1813, the city realized that this was prime real estate. And so they built a street, which is today called Canal Street. And that was to drain the swamps, turn it into usable land. But still, when it rained, your basement filled up with water. You had a basement. And it would be filled with all kinds of diseases and insects and snakes. And so people really didn't want to live there. Even the houses they built out of wood, they stood for a while, but then they'd start building them out of bricks and stone. Well, even those would start sinking and cracking. And so it was a place where nobody wanted to live, except the extremely poor. And the area today, which is there, is also called Five Points, where five streets came together. Today, that's on the border between the Lower East Side and Chinatown. And it was a dangerous area. Crime, criminals, poor people, prostitution, gambling, drugs, you name it. It was not a nice area to live. Pictures of the five points. You see the wooden shack. Uh, which people lived in when they had to. They had animals behind the house because there was no refrigeration in the early 1800s. So if you had kids, you had a milk cow or you had goats or chickens or rabbits for meat. The picture on the left, uh, you see five points, streets coming together. Look down in the bottom left-hand corner. You see a pig. Pigs were a protected animal because they were the garbage collectors. Threw out potato scraps or he threw out a dead cat or the head of a chicken. The pig would come running and that was his dinner. So it was a not, uh, not a great place where you'd want to live. Gradually, the English and Scotch started moving in. Once again, not because they wanted to, but because they had no choice. Not that much remains from the early Lower East Side, except for a handful of churches. Here we see the Willard Street Methodist Church dating from 1826. Now, you can see it is a rather simple structure. Today, it's a synagogue, uh, still a synagogue. Good chance it'll go back to being a church sometime, uh, unless historians decide to preserve it in its synagogue incarnation. But look at the walls. They're made out of small stones. I mean, these are not big chunks of stone brought from someplace else. They're not big chunks of marble. They are stones which, when someone was building a house and they would have stones piled in front of them, people would collect them and use them for building their churches and later even synagogues. So this building still stands from the Scotch and English period. <clears throat> Another church from about the same period is 1829. This is on Henry Street. And this is St. Augustine's English Episcopal Church. Most of the English were Episcopalians. In England, it's called the Church of England. Methodists were also English or Scottish. Well, this is the church the way it looks on the left today. It lost its tower in a big storm. And once again, you see it's nothing elegant about it. It's made of field stone that the people collected. And uh, when they had the time and the money, they'd buy some cement and uh, gradually build the church. Well, 
New York was a slave city for its in Dutch and English colonial period and well into the um, independent republic after the American Revolution. And this church still has its section, which you see at the bottom on the right, where it's marked BM. These were for black members. Churches were segregated. Even if you were no longer a slave and had gotten your freedom, you were still expected to sit in a segregated section. And many of the slaves of New York had accepted the religion of their masters. If your master was Episcopalian, you became Episcopalian. If your master was German Lutheran, you became a German Lutheran. If your master was a Jew, you became Jewish and went to the synagogue with your master. So churches had their black members section. Another church which dates from the early Republic is the first Scottish Presbyterian church. It is on Rutgers Street. This church was built by Henry Rutgers, who lived from 1745 to 1830. He donated the money to build it. Now, you might recognize the name Rutgers as Rutgers University in New Jersey. Well, Henry, like anybody else with half a brain, realized that as soon as they got some money, they had better move out of the swampy area, and he ended up moving eventually to New Jersey. And this is what the church looked like originally. Uh, you see the horses and carriages in front of it, and this is what it looks like today. Once again, simple field stone, nothing elegant, no marble. Uh, today it is still a church. It is St. Teresa's Roman Catholic Church. So like with the Bialystok Synagogue, which began as a church, when the settlers would move away and move someplace else, they would just simply sell their house of worship to the next group that came in and took over. So the Presbyterian Church simply became a Catholic church. Well, that's what remains of the English and Scotch period. By the middle of the 1800s, a whole new group of people were arriving. And these were the Irish Catholics and the Germans. Germans were Catholic, Lutheran, various other kinds of Protestants, as well as Jewish. So they started moving in. Well, of course, nobody, these old English and Dutch families were not happy to see all of these Irish Catholics. Most of them didn't even speak English. They spoke Gaelic and had never gone to school. They were farmers moving into the city. And the Germans started coming in, and the English didn't like them very much because they didn't even speak English either. So they started moving in. Well, the Irish, as we well know, were fleeing the potato famine. The disease which swept over Ireland and most of Europe, killing the potato plants, which was the major food source for most farm people. And so some two and a half million Irish ended up fleeing Ireland and arriving in New York. For the picture here on the left, it shows the Vatican in the background and you see these crocodiles well they're not really crocodiles if you look closely you'll see they are catholic bishops being sent by the pope to take over america and you see these poor protestants standing there seeing the invasion of the catholics the germans came for a very different reason mainly because Germany in the middle of the 1800s was divided into various smaller states, which were constantly going to war against each other. And so many young Germans, like my mother's family, decided to leave Germany to escape military service, to escape the wars. Plus, in the 1840s, there was a revolutionary mo movement in Germany 
to get rid of all these little states, unite Germany, but the revolution was put down and uh, Germany remained um, divided and going to war for another couple decades. So the Irish and the Germans started moving in. Well, the Irish built St. Mary's Irish Roman Catholic Church, which is still standing on Grand Street. Now you can see on the right of the church there and behind it, there are towering skyscrapers with apartment buildings. But back in the 1820s, it would be lined with wooden houses, some brick houses, marketplaces. And this was, again, there was no marble involved in this. They were bricks which you could make uh, from the clay in the ground uh, and build your church. Well, the Irish were lowest people on the totem pole. And you see signs, help wanted, no Irish need apply. You see cartoons portraying the money-grubbing Catholic priests and the Irish, which are made to look almost like they were gorillas. This is a famous um, uh, cartoon uh, made by Thomas Nast, who was himself a German immigrant of this period and wrote cartoons like this. Well, he definitely didn't think much of the Irish. So even the Germans and the Irish didn't get along very well. This is a German Lutheran church from 1857. And once again, by the time the German Lutherans started moving out, it became a German Orthodox synagogue. Well, you can see again, it's made of brick. Uh, and to the left, you see a three-story house, which might even date from that period. Well, I got in there once. I saw the door was open, and they were doing some electrical work. And so I just snuck in and started taking pictures. Well, unfortunately, the very next weekend, the church, which became a synagogue, burned to the ground. That's a typical thing in New York. When you get a historic big building like this, a lot of people want to preserve it. It is part of history, and the interior was absolutely beautiful, like a museum. But the real estate developers like to get rid of them so that they can build a 20-story apartment building or office building and make money. So... Uh, it's perfectly possible that the people who were doing the um, work in the building uh, ended up leaving a couple wires loose and uh, planned to burn it down. On the right, you see them tearing down the last remains of this beautiful building. The Irish took over the old Rutgers Church uh, in 1863. By then, the Protestants were all gone, and uh, the Irish took it over. The picture you see at the left shows a little bit about what the Lower East Side was. It was tenement apartment buildings. It was um, a place where a church tower like this one would really um, dominate the landscape. Today, this church is lost in a cluster of uh, tall um, skyscrapers and apartment buildings. Another building which is still there, for how long, I don't know, this is the Norfolk Street German Baptist Church from 1850. On the left, you see it. It was a rather nice uh, German church with a big stained glass window and two towers uh, and a little tower in the middle. Well, as the Germans started moving out and the Orthodox Jews from Eastern Europe started moving in, it became a synagogue. Well, the last time I was in the Lower East Side, it was still standing. 
because of its historic importance, surrounded again by tall apartment buildings. And I get the impression that they're just waiting for it to burn down. Now, this is important because this is where Yeshiva University began among the Eastern European Orthodox Jews. Another building which is still standing is the Congregation Rodef Shalom, German Reform Temple on the left, and the original Temple Emmanuel on Christie Street. Today, Temple Emmanuel is a big synagogue on Fifth Avenue, but it began in the Lower East Side, the German J Reform Jews. First, they rented a little wooden building, and then they got more numerous, and they ended up um, building their first synagogue. This is another synagogue which still exists. Uh, this is the congregation An Shechezed, which was German Reform. Today, it's called the Orensans, because it's been taken over by uh, a guy named Orensans, and... Since most of the Jews have long moved away, he turned it into sort of an entertainment and banquet complex. And as you can see from the picture in the right, it's still a very, very beautiful uh, interior that is pretty well kept up. But I've heard they also um, encourage people to have bar mitzvahs and uh, weddings and other events in this um, uh, a uh, former synagogue. <clears throat> well, the Irish and the Germans who moved in um, lived in what today we call tenements, where you'd have maybe two families living in a couple of rooms uh, squeezed together. A lot of them didn't have running water or toilets. You had to go down to the street to a pump to get water. And this history is well preserved at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum, where they are buying these old tenement buildings, restoring them, and trying to preserve the history of the Lower East Side and its many different inhabitants. Well, the Irish and the Germans, just like the English and the Scots before them, when they got a little bit of money, they moved out. They moved to another neighborhood. By the 1870s and 80s, the, the, the uh, English and the Scots were long gone. The Germans and the uh, Irish were moving out. Many of them were moving way uptown into a brand new neighborhood, which was emerging, called Harlem. In the 1870s, uh, Harlem emerged because Central Park had been finished. And so Harlem emerged as a neighborhood for middle class white families. It hadn't become black yet. That would happen later. But like every neighborhood, na uh, populations change. So just like the Lower East Side had its own diverse history in different periods, so Harlem merged as a, a middle-class white neighborhood, uh, gradually becoming African-American. And today it's well on its way to becoming a white neighborhood again. Well, the Eastern European Jews were basically fleeing religious oppression in Eastern Europe. Countries like Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine, um, were part of the Russian Empire. And the Russian Empire had no great love for Jews. And so many of them started migrating to the United States. And they moved into the tenements that the Irish and the Germans had built. To, uh, their outdoor markets were famous. Uh, fruits and vegetables and milk and meat uh, were basically sold on the street. Uh, if you lived in a tenement with five or six other people or even other families, uh, you didn't sit around in the tenement much. You, if it was a nice day, you were out in the streets and kids did what they had to to survive. 
uh, like their parents. As soon as you were big enough to walk, you were just basically doing something to add to the meager income of the family. It was this during this period that the old uh, church ended up becoming a synagogue, 1885. And this is where, in 1886, a yeshiva was built, and gradually the yeshiva grew in size and started adding secular topics to educate these new immigrants who didn't speak English. Many of them had no urban skills, so they had to do what they could to um, adjust to a whole new world. And so the Eastern European Jews simply started buying or taking over or, um, the old churches as the Irish and the Germans moved uptown. This is the Bialystok Synagogue, the old English Methodist Church, the uh, building I showed you at the very beginning. And here you can see it became a um, synagogue in 1905. Well, the whole interior was redone to reflect the character of a synagogue. This is the famous Bialystoker synagogue. Today in New York, uh, um, when you say a Biali, you think of that little bread roll with a dash of fruit in the middle, which is a Biali. Well, the old first immigrants who started coming in the late 1800s their children gradually moved away. But the old people wanted to stay, so they built the Bialystoker home for the aged. And uh, so they still remain there. But as gradually as they uh, die off, uh, um, who knows what's going to happen to the synagogue? You turn it into a museum. Very often with these synagogues on the Lower East Side, if you walk by on the Sabbath, they'll be out there, you know, looking for somebody who looks Jewish so they can get the correct number of men to have a religious service. And very often they don't. Other synagogues were built by other groups. Um, uh, on the left, you see a congregation, B'nai Yaakob, uh, on Stanton Street. It was basically just a regular building, um, fits in with all the other ones, and turned into a synagogue. On the right is the Janina Synagogue. These were um, uh, Jews, Orthodox Jews from Greece, who ended up settling in the Lower East Side. Uh, and they took over a, an apartment building like this, a three-story building, and turned it into a synagogue. Um, the one on the left is an apartment house now. You can see from the windows. Uh, the Janina is still a functioning synagogue. Um, but once again, most of the Romanian Jews have moved away. Uh, but they do maintain a very nice museum. Well, the Jews also built their ethnic infrastructure. On the left was the daily forward building. In Yiddish, it was Forvets. The picture in the middle shows the top of the building on the left. And you see it written in Hebrew letters, uh, the word Forvets, which in German and Yiddish mean forward, to march forward. Today, this is a Chinese church and um, office and apartment building. On the right, the Orthodox Jews built Yarmolovsky's banks. And Yarmolovsky, one of the richest and most successful uh, Orthodox Jewish bankers from the Lower East Side, uh, opened his bank in 1873. And the current building was built in 1911. This today is a Chinese uh, uh, apartment and office building. But luckily, a bit of history is being preserved. The Forbert sign is still on the building. And Yarmolovsky's bank, with the dates of its founding, are still on the entrance to the bank. Theaters, Yiddish language theaters, such as the one we see in the middle, um, played all kinds of uh, 
um, y Yiddish translations of famous plays, as well as um, ones written by Eastern European Jews. Once again, the theater in the middle is still there, but I believe it is a paint store. Uh, I'd love to get in to see what remains of the old Yiddish theater. The Kletzer Brotherly Aid Society. The building is still there, but as you can see, it is now a Chinese funeral home. Originally, it was an Orthodox Jewish um, uh, uh, funeral home and brotherly aid society. The sign uh, way up at the top, it still says the Kletzner um, um, Brotherly Aid Association or Society. And uh, an aid society was a type of insurance because you didn't have um, Social Security back then. You didn't have Medicare and Medicaid. And so each religious group took care of its own. And so when an Orthodox Jew would have a baby, he would give maybe 10 cents a month or something uh, to the Brotherly Aid Society. And if someone in the family died, the society would make sure that there was a respectable funeral. Even if the people were impoverished, the society would give them a respectable funeral. And don't forget, back in the late 1800s, probably half of the children born made it past their first birthday. Child mortality was terrible. Women had babies at home. No, nobody could even afford a doctor. So this was the golden age of the tenements where people moved in. And of course, they wanted to get out as quickly as they could. During the summer, these buildings were stifling, hot and humid. After a rainstorm, it would be moldy. And so people were constantly living on balconies, living on the roof, uh, drying their laundry outside. The Lower East Side had half a million people crammed into it uh, by 1900. But yet immigrants kept coming. The Civil War boom, 1860 to 65, started attracting more and more people. Jobs were available. By the late 1800s, New York was an industrial center of textiles, steel, machinery, things that we today associate with Detroit and Chicago. These were all located in New York originally. One magnificent synagogue, which remains, is the Eldridge Street Synagogue and Museum. You can see on the left, they are um, repairing the exterior, putting those little towers on the top. They're putting those back. Um, and uh, it is in what they call the Hispano-Moorish architecture. This is the architecture of the Jews of Spain. You can see the Arab influence in the archways and in the door and the decorations. This was the synagogue of the rich Eastern European Jews uh, in the late 1800s. It has been restored. Uh, I've been there many times and they have a museum. Um, they have concerts, but once again, there are very few Orthodox Jews who live in the neighborhood, but it has successfully managed to survive. Another building which dates from the period is the Rabbi Jacob Joseph School uh, of 1902. It was a boarding school for boys uh, at that time, Jewish boys. Um, of course, today it has become a rooming house for um, Chinese immigrants. A, a yeshiva, which still thrives, mainly by bringing in students from Brooklyn or New Jersey, uh, is the Jerusalem Yeshiva, 1907. 
Uh, it is orthodox and it still survives uh, and seems to be doing pretty well, but it has to bring in students from elsewhere or some students even live at the um, yeshiva, but it is still functioning. The Educational Alliance is still there, 1889. This was built by wealthy German Jews who had moved uptown uh, as a way to educate these new Eastern European Jews coming in. And since the Jews who built it were reformed Jews, these were modern Jews. There were no beards and black hats and strings and all that kind of stuff, which distinguishes the Orthodox Jews. These were Jews who went to the opera, who spoke English, uh, who had worked in offices. So they trained the Eastern European Jews uh, in job training skills. Women could become secretaries. They learned typing and shorthand. The boys they learned accounting and other business skills. They learned proper English. And of course, they had free concerts uh, um, during the week. They also wanted them to be modern Jews, dress like Americans, speak good English, get out of the ghetto, and join the mainstream of American life. The Hester Street Market was called the Pig Market. Nobody knows why, except maybe it was the only street where pork was not sold. Many books and movies have been written about Hester Street uh, and the accumulation of Eastern European immigrants filling the area, the markets, the synagogues, the yeshivas, and uh, the um, other activities that went on in this fascinating Jewish, Orthodox Jewish period in the history of the Lower East Side. A lot of these signs of the past are disappearing, like the churches which remain from the Scottish and the uh, English period, the churches remain of the Irish and German period, but more and more are being torn down, or they'll be transformed from uh, an or a Jewish organization um, and turned into an apartment building. I happened to be walking in the Lower East Side one day, and they were tearing down a part of a building, and they tore off the um, woodwork or whatever was there, and underneath was a sign dating back to the late 1800s. Uh, I don't really know what it is. It's called Agudat. I mean, it's an organization of some kind, um, uh, maybe it was a yeshiva as well, but that was visible for a short period, and then that was torn down. So as the people move out, new people move in, the neighborhood adapts. <clears throat> well, most of the Orthodox Jews of the Lower East Side ended up in the melting pot. Um, um, the famous phrase melting pot was uh, invented by um, an English uh, Jewish writer called Israel Tsangville, who said that the Jews, like everybody else, are going to go into the big melting pot that is America, and they will become 100% Americans. And he was an advocate of intermarriage where Catholics and Jews and Germans and everybody else just intermarry and become a new race of people called Americans. So what's the Lower East Side today? Well, as the Jews started moving out, uh, the Lower East Side started declining. It was dirty, it was run down, rents were cheap. Um, people didn't want to live there. It was getting dangerous because following World War I in the 1920s, the United States slammed closed the door of immigration. So no new immigrants were coming in. You see on the graph, the 1960s and 70s were the lowest point of immigration. The Lower East Side was largely 
deserted. But in 1965, the American government passed the Hart Cellar Immigration Law. This opened the gates of immigration, and you see the graph going through the ceiling. Well, who was coming over? There were no more English or Scots, no more Germans or Irish, no more Eastern European Jews. The new people who took over the Lower East Side were Asians and Hispanics. There are about one million Chinese in New York today. It is the largest Chinese city outside of Asia. Well, they're gradually tearing down the tenements that you still see a couple standing there that date from the 1800s and putting up brand new apartment blocks, uh, uh, business powers. The Chinese are very good at business and they are import, export, manufacturing, trade. And so the entire face of the Lower East Side, not just its population, but its visual aspect is also changing. Most of the Lower East Side Chinese come from the province of Fujiang, which is the yellow uh, part of China, the southern part. And they are establishing their own presence. For example, on the right, you see the Fujiang American Association on East Broadway. Um, beside it, interestingly, is an old synagogue, which is now a Buddhist temple. And so you see Chinese signs all over. Um, it is a booming neighborhood, um, and it is right beside Chinatown. So the Chinese have taken over not just the old Chinatown, but Little Italy is now predominantly Chinese. The Lower East Side is predominantly Chinese. In fact, so many Chinese are coming that they're taking over neighborhoods like Flushing. <clears throat> old buildings are being torn down. There you see St. Teresa's Church still has a couple old buildings on, on one side, but behind it is a towering skyscraper. And so these are beginning to be built to accommodate the huge Chinese immigration. They bring their organizations. This one is a former uh, yeshiva, which is now a Buddhist association. Many of the Chinese are also Christian. So you see a community church, a new life uh, uh, in some of the older uh, tenements and smaller buildings, which will probably be torn down eventually and replaced with skyscrapers. This is the synagogue of Bnei Kawari, which in 1977 became a Confucianist temple, not a Buddhist. And you can see the statue in the front and you go in and there are businesses on the ground floor and they have offices and other businesses in the rest of the building. And so the Chinese bring their religions, they bring their language, they bring their holidays, a celebration of the Chinese New Year. <clears throat> of course, when they first arrive, they don't have that much money. If they had a lot of money, they'd still be in China or living in the Upper East Side. But the ones who are moving into the Lower East Side are the new immigrants, many of them poor. So they build their Buddhist temples, which is basically the ground floor of an apartment building. And in the basement, the ground floor is a store. First floor is a temple and people live in tenements above it. And this is very typical adapting an older building, which dates probably from the mid 1800s, adapting it to modern times. As the temple gets more and more um, uh, resources, it will move to maybe an old church or an old synagogue, transform it into a Buddhist temple, and then eventually build 
a brand new temple in traditional Chinese style. The Kletzer Brotherly Aid Society is now a Chinese funeral parlor, the, the um, Bo Fook, and you can see that at the top is still the old sign in Yiddish, but everything below it is in um, Chinese tradition. Very famous in Chinatown is they have set up their own bus system, which goes from Toronto, Canada, to Boston, down to New York, down to Philadelphia, Washington, Baltimore, down into Virginia, North Carolina. I take the Chinatown bus all the time because it's cheaper than Greyhound, much cheaper than the train. They don't stop along the way. It is a very efficient, cheap, and well-organized bus system. <clears throat> Now, what's going to be the future of the Lower East Side? Well, we began with the English and Scots, then the Irish and the Germans, then the Eastern European Jews, then the Chinese, and now the next chapter is going to be the arrival of aliens. Because if you're a rich alien, you would stay comfortably at home in Mars or Jupiter. And if you did come to Earth, you'd come as a tourist. So you'd go up to the top of the um, World Trade Center and you'd visit the Metropolitan Museum and stay in a nice hotel. But the immigrants, once again, are going to be minorities. They're going to be minority religions. They're going to be poor people looking for a better life. So this is going to be the future of the Lower East Side. So get ready for it. Well, that's me in the Lower East Side. And as you can see, it is once again a booming neighborhood going through its um, Chinese and Hispanic uh, chapter. And eventually we'll move into immigrants, from Mars or Jupiter or wherever. So thank you very much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed the tour of the Lower East Side and I hope to see you sometime in the future. So have a good day.